Welcome to Drinking Bros, presented by GhostBed.com. Welcome to Drinking Bros. Finally, Dan, it has happened. It has happened today. We've got guys we fucked on the show. Mm -hmm. More specifically, uh, their host, Corinne's here. Yay! Wait, is it Corinne or Corinne? Corinne. Corinne. Uh, Corinne, come that on. That would be hilarious, Somebody though, if it was like, I am Guys We Fucked. I'm Guys We Fucked Fisher. That's my name. <laughs> I mean, you That's can what change. everybody knows you, though, as. You I mean, can, it's crazy, it's right? It's going to be on my tombstone. It's going to be one of the Guys We Fucked girls. It's what it's going to say on my tombstone. Well, <laughs> which is fine. For those of you who are unfamiliar with this show, uh, they are the original Call Her Daddy, and then uh, they took it from you, uh, it seems like. Um, it, it, well, do, you, do you feel I, like that, by the way? Uh, there's another podcast that blatantly stole our idea, which I won't even say. Call Her Daddy, I actually like because, number one, we're millennials. They're Gen Z. Um, and when you listen to Alexandra Cooper and how she like came about with the idea, she actually did change it. She made it more like a, a po podcast version of TikTok mm. because they jump cut the actual audio, which right. we don't do. Uh. And I think would be kind of obnoxious for most millennials to listen to, but it's definitely like, it was a, it was a smart move. You like, right. you want to take something and you want to improve upon it for a new group of people. Um, other podcasts just like blatantly stole the idea. So, mm. and also like call her daddy. Those girls are like way hotter than us and we're not trying to pretend that they're not. So <laughs> more power to them. I think, <laughs> and the way I look at it is like, look, there's over 800,000 podcasts out there in the world and uh, there is plenty of space for, for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I think when you started and we started, cause we were around 2015, um, you guys were around that that time period, I believe, right? December 2013 is when we started. Oh, wow. So you're two, you're, you were full two years ahead of us. I, we were ahead of the game in 2015, we thought. Um, you guys were OGs uh, back in the day. And, um, you know, I, I think as it goes along, the, like the podcasting world, I know for a fact, because I'm, I'm a Hollywood guy, there was a casting call out that said, we're looking for a show like Guys We Fucked. And they were trying to pair two girls together. Oh, that's very interesting. I mean, I kind of figured, like, like if anything, I certainly wouldn't, you know, uh, be blaming Alexandra or Sophia. I would, I'm like, yeah, I'm sure it's like Barstool. I mean, uh, the CEO of Barstool, I notice, follows me. Uh, oh, Dave Portnoy, no shit. Well, oh no, the other, well, isn't there, because it's Steve Oh, Portnoy, it's a woman. There, yes, there's a woman. It's, it's Erica Nardini, yeah. who Congrats, I love. Yeah. And I, the only reason I even looked at her profile was because uh, a colleague of mine was talking about what an incredible businesswoman um, she is. And then she was already following me and I was mm. like, hmm. I actually heard the same from a lot of her colleagues. So we know a lot of people over there. We know a lot of people obviously in the uh, podcast ad industry and everybody's a big fan of her. I, yeah. I, I, I believe- uh, I've chatted with her actually. Some um, folks introduced us to her, what, at the Super Bowl? Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I've I chatted remember. with her for a while. She's yeah. very, very bright. Yeah, and um, yeah. I mean, she's she's look, she's running a, a massive company. Mm -hmm. and clearly, they're doing well. They yep. sold a third of it for 136 million dollars to Penn yeah. Gambling, which you know is has been awesome and hilarious to watch. Dave Portnoy and I just party all over the world. I love for that. Months and months. So and months. funny. I also enjoyed the way that whole situation with uh, Call Her Daddy got handled. Yeah, they just like put all the info out there, and it turns out that Alexandra, the one that's still there, did everything. Yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah, is yeah. super talented. Like you said, the foresight to, while it may be offensive is not the right word. It's just when my millennial brain, my older, like early 80s birth millennial brain is You're like, a cusper. like, God damn it, please stop with this. I can't take it anymore. But I'm sure for the audience she has, it's amazing for it them, is, right? Yeah. Because yeah. I try to ask uh, uh, Brittany's 12 year old, like, hey, show me this. And I'm like, oh, God, turn that off now. What the fuck are you doing? But if it plays, it plays. Right, it does, and that's why I enjoy your show more than theirs because I, you guys are really smart, really. Because you're the you're the demo for her show. That's how psychographic data works, Ross. Yes, that's why. Yeah, we, it, it doesn't well, make. There are different. There's different ways that also like it's. I don't even think it's necessary to compare it because like. Yeah, yeah. So our show, our our my uh, my original concept for guys we fucked was that it was going to be a coward stern for girls. Mm -hmm. Whereas when I uh, for call her daddy, I feel like that gives me more like Tucker Max vibes. If you want to go really really. That's a that's a good metaphor. Actually. That's a good Metaphor, yeah. That is a good yeah. metaphor because he was more about the individual experiences being discussed right there. And I know you guys started out talking about the guys you fucked or whatever, right? But it's obviously yeah. developed into something much broader than that now. 
Yeah, their show's more like sexual adventures right. and just kind of exactly what you would want from women in their 20s because I think Alexandra's like 23. She's very young. Yeah, yeah. They're very mm-hmm. young. Um, and that's what you do. If we were still kind of talking about that, uh, Christina and I, in our 30s, <laughs> then it's like, oh, you haven't grown as people. It's like kind of sad. <laughs> there, there's a moment oh. in life where it's just not cute anymore. And I'm not sure if there's an age that it happens. Uh, I think that there's an age for it, for sure. But uh, there's certainly a moment. There's, there's a, certainly a moment uh, where it's not cute for dudes anymore to just like, I don't even remember last weekend, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Blacked yeah, yeah. out the whole time. Ran over some cats. Yeah, Hell yeah. <laughs> like, what the fuck? What else did you do? Did you fucking mow your lawn, asshole? Yeah. Did like, you do anything? Because I can't find the time to go buck wild anymore. Maybe it's my. Maybe I'm jealous. Maybe. Maybe I just want to run over cats. Maybe. What about you? Do you still do you still find the time to get get fucking crazy? You said you're hungover from the election. Yeah, well, I mean, that was that was more of like a planned hangover. We, I, my other uh, newer podcast, Without a Country, that I do with the comedian mm. Joe DeRosa. Oh, I love Joe DeRosa. Oh, Joe's Jesus great. Christ, I love that guy so much. Um, mm. And so uh, that one's, you know, a political show. So we live streamed from for about six hours from the stand, uh, an election night special, and. Uh, I plan to get drunk. Like I, I booked the guests in the order of people I would feel most <laughs> comfortable getting drunk. So the last slot was, you know, Christina Hutchinson mm-hmm. and Ryan Long, two of, of my really close friends. Love Ryan was, Long too. Ryan Long yeah, is I was like, fucking I'll keep funny. get drunk in front of them and not regret it. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, that's funny. We, that's we, good. So this we, is why, by the way, that when, if you're going to get married, let just give the seating chart to the to your wife. Yeah, give I mean, everything to your wife. Fuck let her plan it. And you're never going to be able to. All the men out there, you will never do it. You'll never do it. <laughs> never do it. Stop so, pretending like you know how to do things. To his point, uh, so we did a live election show as well, and uh, we're dudes, and we booked the guests in the wrong order. So we started with Alex Jones. Yeah. Um, and immediately, I think we were shotgunning beers within four minutes with Alex yep. Jones. So oh my we should have ended with Alex and started with someone else. We did not do that because we don't plan shit. We're dudes, right? Yeah. Um, but uh, that was a crazy night, and there's still no ending to it. I mean, we're, we just did a show right before this, and it's like I, I don't know that there's going to be an ending to this election for months and months, and it looks like it'll go to the courts and all that stuff. Yeah, well, that's the reason. Like, I wasn't uh, expecting to get as drunk as I did, but then I started getting text messages from my friends about maybe two thirds through the live stream, and they were like, "I can't believe this is happening again." And I, and so then I was like, "Fuck, is Trump gonna win again?" Because last time, four years ago, I was in uh, a movie theater at this like Democratic Party balloons everywhere, people in like <laughs> Hillary Clinton bobbleheads walking around, like, uh, and we just started like pounding straight vodka at a certain point. Like I was totally that white girl. Uh, but I wasn't sad that Trump won. I was just sad that Hill never got the only thing that she's ever wanted in her life, which was, you know, to be president of the greatest country in the world. So. Yeah. Uh, let, let me ask you that since we're talking about it and this is on everybody's lips right now with the election. Um, I remember 2016 because we did a, a live show uh, that afternoon and then right after, which ended up uh-huh. being 240 in the morning when Trump won. Um, oh, yeah. Now, the, the different part about this, having done two shows during two different election cycles, was when we were doing our live show, it seemed like it was going to be a landslide for Trump and it was going to be over by like 11 o'clock because his leads in all of these states was so huge. And then later on, as our show kept going and we kept getting drunker and drunker, it was like, wait a minute. It, it looks like Biden's coming back, but he, he still doesn't really have a shot. And then it just kind of cut off. And I know for me personally, because we were live on air for shit, Dan, six, seven hours at that mm-hmm. point. Um, I, I just wanted an answer either way. Right. I wanted a beginning, middle and end to the podcast and for the three or 400 people that were there at our, at our live show to walk away with an answer and, and hey, congratulations. I, I still feel this weird hangover from it because there is no answer. Yeah, I mean, I did not think we were going to have it. I went into our live stream not thinking we were going to have an answer because Mm. uh, I 100% knew if Trump was losing that he was going to contest it. And then I kind of felt that Biden would contest it too, which I think is the the right move for the Democratic Party to contest it. Um, Because, I mean, Donald Trump's made it very clear that he's not just going to be like, I lost and leave. Like, I think we're going to have to physically remove him from the White House if he loses. Well, uh, come on. That's hyperbole. Let's let's be real. That's that is that is just abject. part of the Amy Coney Barrett because I was not even I was not like uh, from day one. I wasn't like an Amy Coney Barrett hater. But I really do. Without a country, our show is 
all about uh, trying to actually see both sides of mm -hmm. the political uh, spectrum. But I mean, she wouldn't even answer that it was like inappropriate to say things like I'm not going to leave the White House. <laughs> like, that's weird. They're well, I mean, th th that's that's a that's a political trap, though. You ask a question like that to try to get the person to go on the record against the person who nominated them. That's nonsense. That is that is a cheap parlor trick in politics. Look, Trump's a fucking dummy and he says dumb shit all the time. But the Senate trying to use that to force her into a position where she has to go against him isn't what has no, her, it has nothing it has nothing to do with her credibility or her ability as a, as a judge now i thought they should have waited frankly uh, like sure trump had every legal right and the senate had every legal right to nominate and then confirm this woman absolutely and it seems like based on even cnn's coverage that she's probably going to be an okay judge keep an eye out for that we'll see yeah you never really know these, that's why these lifetime appointments are, are ludicrous but there's no reason to believe that Frankly, I, I, I don't believe that at all. Yeah, because you look at Gorsuch, in my opinion, right? I, I think uh, Gorsuch is not what Trump thought he was going to no. be. Well, I mean, look. He sided <laughs> against Trump on a couple issues already. And it's yeah. just like. And, and, and John Roberts has always done it as well. These people err on the side of jurisprudence, typically, unless you're a radical. I think people like Anna Scalia, I feel like he was a radical guy. He got involved in legislative stuff when he should have kept his fucking mouth shut, yeah. frankly. And it's, it's, it's embarrassing there, honestly, to see somebody that's supposed to be if anything has to be beyond reproach in this country, it's got to be the goddamn Supreme Court, right? Because we, what do we do yeah. if they're not beyond reproach? We can't fucking call a vote and get them out of there. Like the Senate has to remove these motherfuckers. It's never going to happen. But f as, as far as Trump refusing to leave office, the Secret Service works for the country. I promise you that. I know these people. I know these men and women that work for this thing. If Trump on... on, on let's say he loses on Inauguration Day. If he refuses to leave, they will grab him by the scruff of his neck him out of and there, walk yeah. outside and drop him on the fucking That's pavement. That's what I literally just said, though. I know, I mean, but there's no way that would happen. That's <laughs> but, uh, ridiculous I, yeah. to think that he's going to make them drag him physically out of the White House. He's 74 years old. That's it's just ridiculous to I, say I, that. That's, that is absolute hyperbole. Yeah. I don't think it's that crazy, guys. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, well, I mean, look, it, it, I just uh, he'll never stay. He'll be out of there. But um, uh, with, with your show, by the way, and the popularity of it, um, I wanted to ask you, because uh, we had had this offer before to go behind a paywall. You're currently on Luminary. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. We've had the same offers. Um, we've had uh, many guests who, who have uh, taken those offers, mm -hmm. like uh, Michael Rappaport. Rappaport's been on the show. Uh, He's on Luminary with us, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I've, uh, I've been to his house. He's funny as fuck, by the way. Funny as shit. I, um, Love that guy. Yeah, I don't even care about his politics. People bitch about why that. Would, I don't what, give a why, shit. His, the joke is either funny or it's not funny. Exactly. The political bend to it is is meaningless. If you if a joke is funny and every, most people think it's funny and you don't because of your political beliefs, then you're kind of an asshole, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, just let people be fucking funny, for Christ's sake. Can we have that one goddamn thing? Can we just have that <laughs> with all the we, with fucking spray tan Dan over here running for president? And Sleepy Joe that can't keep his eyes open. Can I just have this one thing? Can I just laugh? Just can I listen comedy. To, can I listen to Tom Segura say phrases like pussy pudding? Yeah. Can I hear that without somebody fucking coming and telling me that it's wrong? Yeah. For Christ's sake. Exactly. Or listen to your guys' show. I, your guys' show is funny as fuck. It's great. I your show is great. Um, have you had you problems? Had it Are you talking about the old episodes? Well, I mean, you, your episodes still leak out on all, all these RSS feeds. I mean, Luminaries... They're, come on, man. They, they can't. They know they're a smart tech company. They're trying to do something here, but they know that these uh, that even even the paywall is not really a paywall, technically speaking. Right. Because episodes well, get of course. out. I mean, we were trying to wink, wink, tell people who were complaining, like, we can't listen to it if we're in a country that Luminary doesn't go to. And I was like, use your brain. You yeah, know, yeah. go to ExpressVPN yeah. and, uh, you know, set yourself up in the right country and then do what you want. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. What, what's been the reaction from the fans? Because I, I know I know on Rappaport's side, right? People hammer him every fucking day on, mm. on Instagram and they're like, dude, you're behind the paywall. Fuck you. You're behind a paywall. Was that the initial response to your show and your fans? Yeah, absolutely. That was like a, it, it was a year of uh, finessing the situation. Uh, but I think it led into a really great larger conversation that we've been having for the past uh, year, kind of about women in business and about making money as women. And, and, and I mean, it's, it goes for all artists, but I think specifically like, women don't think enough financially. We don't think about moves that are gonna make us more money. We think more like moves that are gonna make men like us, you know, like from a heterosexual perspective. Mm. Uh, and I think that is uh, the wrong way to go. What do you think is uh, the solution to something like that? Like I've got a lot of ideas about the American education system. Mine are primarily about 
uh, learning how instead of what to think and developing character and an idea, like a passion for service when you're young. For, for example, mm -hmm. I think that, uh, forget about the military or police or any of that bullshit. Uh, cause I mean, I, I was in the military obviously, but forget about all that. I'm talking about like from first grade or even maybe even kindergarten on each year, instead of some foreign language requirement, there is a requirement to serve your community in some way to teach people what it means. And it has a lot of different benefits, right? So you get to see what someone who's in a much worse situation than you looks like. So you have some perspective in life. So you have a little appreciation for what's going on. And also it forces people to move outside their comfort zone and to learn what the impact is. I think that positive reinforcement, how do you, have you ever felt better in your life ever than doing something for someone that couldn't do something in return for you? Does, is, is, is there any way to make yourself feel better than that other than maybe heroin? <laughs> right. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, service has always been a part of my life. I'm a, I was a lifelong Girl mm -hmm. Scout, completed the entire program. I mean, I think that's what, you know, Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts of America is really about. I mean, right. to me, the main thing that you're doing is service. Uh, and it definitely, I mean, it, I don't know, like I went to public school in New Jersey mm -hmm. and we did a lot of, I mean, saving the rainforest was very big right. when I was young. That was kind of like something that you don't really hear about ever anymore, but that was real big when I was in school. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I remember baking a lot of cupcakes uh, for many different <laughs> charities. Right, yeah. Uh, in college, I certainly did. I did the Big Brothers, Big Sisters of America. Uh, right now, my like organization of choice is uh, this thing called New Alternatives for LGBTQ homeless youth. Mm. So I think there's always a way. And uh, that's definitely like something that we tried to move into on guys. We fucked like away from these salacious stories and more into like, what can you do to help besides just like, start you know trying to ruin someone's career via twitter because right. I, I really just don't think that's the way right. uh, for progress no I, mean, I, I don't either and and you were talking about women in business in particular yeah. um i to my knowledge you guys were the first female podcast to go behind a paywall uh because you guys did start so early uh the rest of these people is all celebrities and shit that they're hiring without having a podcast and then they're they're behind a paywall um right. for you why yeah. why was that important uh for for other women uh, well, yeah, it, I mean, number one, it is kind of a Cinderella story and that's why Joe Rogan had, you know, started mentioning us on his show, which was so kind of him and obviously great free press because we are, you know, we were one of the first top podcasts to be, uh, hosted by complete unknowns when mm -hmm. we started, like we were barely past open mic comedians when we started. Um, and it was important just because like, I mean, part of the reason we went behind the paywall full disclosure is because some of our fans were listening for the wrong reason. And with a show as personal as Guys We Fucked, uh, we could either you know change the quality and share less and, and keep it in front of the paywall or go behind it and go back to our roots where we're really sharing these kind of like diary page moments from our lives, which is what we wanted to do. Uh, Christina and I like doing that because we learn from it. We're, ha you know, when I'm sitting there, I don't, I'm not thinking about a million people listening. I'm thinking about how can I honestly express my feelings or the situation I'm going through with Christina so that she can give me the best advice possible. Uh, and, uh, and the opposite, but, uh, it was important because like we had, we had never missed it. And to this day, uh, we've been on the air for, what is it now? Seven and a half years. Mm -hmm. We've never one time missed an episode every Friday for seven and a half years, I have connected to Wi-Fi, no matter where I was in the world, uploaded this podcast, made sure it was on time, good quality, not phoning it in. Um, and, you know, after six and a half years of doing that, I think it was fair to take a raise. And I think it was also just like good setting a precedent. That's what people don't think about the precedent. So for setting a precedent for women in podcasting, especially starting as an unknown that you can sign this multi-million dollar contract, that's great for all women in this business. And it's very short sighted to not think, think about that. How many, like how many point, years is it for you? Uh, what was your deal? Like how many years are you on your contract to your contract? Gotcha. That's mm -hmm. a good length for a podcast. Yeah, it is. Cause um, you, I mean, let's be honest. If things go the way they seem to be going, uh, two years is a good time because in two years, uh, uh, independent media is going to rule everything and your value will increase. So you have an opportunity to, uh, you know, cash in on that again, hopefully. Cause regardless of what you might think about delivering this information to whomever the, uh, the listener is, 
it, it requires a pretty good bit of money to do all this stuff, like building sets, cameras, employees to get all this stuff done. Right. Yeah. And it's, it's, if you feel like you're doing something positive and I feel like you guys really are just by, uh, having o open discussions about things, it, it, it's kind of the, the way you described it just now was kind of like, uh, the inverse rather, or the inverse of, of what our political discourse in America is right now, where as soon we, we just wait, it seems like we start these conversations looking for the first chance to disagree. And then we hang on that disagreement and don't move anything forward. So there's no solution to come from that, obviously, but it also, it breaks down the public trust and the idea of the national discourse in general. Everybody just assumes the other side is full of shit. Like somebody may be misinformed. Somebody may be wrong. Somebody may be right, but it doesn't seem like it because of the optics. There's a lot of different things that can go on there, but everybody seems to, to just retreat back to their party line, whatever it happens to be. Right. And I don't, I, that, that's so problematic for a, a number of reasons. So I can, it, it's interesting that you say that to be, and you, you didn't say this, I'm paraphrasing. I'm, I'm, I'm actually, yeah, I guess I'm paraphrasing, but the idea is that you could be more authentic if you move behind a paywall which is important, right? Mm -hmm. in, in, in independent yeah. media, authenticity is the key. And so in politics as well, by the way, but in, in a particularly in independent media. So I wonder uh, if there isn't some lesson to be learned there for people where maybe you make, your, you, you make yourself more exclusive in some way and somehow the benefit of that is to have a more a genuine conversation. That's why I like to, uh, I'm not a religious person, but that 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 verse in the Bible that says, remove the plank from your own, own eye before you start looking for splinters in somebody else's. Mm -hmm. Dealing with dealing with your community first, whatever it happens to be, mm -hmm. whether it's fucking white people or dudes or women, whether it's fucking uh, 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 Christians or whether it's whatever the fuck, right. right? Military people, police, whatever community is having some kind of issue, your first instinct should be to look inward. Like, are we doing everything we're supposed to be doing? Do you do, you do that because... If I see, if, if I'm like approaching a crosswalk or something, the first thing I do is make sure if, if there are people with me that everybody's paying attention and shit, making sure that I'm looking at all the signals. All right, I've got the green hand. I can walk through here. It's, it's fine. I still look for traffic and stuff, but obviously I know that it's okay for me to do this. We, we pro, like human beings process all that shit before we make decisions. We do it every single day and we don't even think about it, but somehow it's, it's evaded us completely in the political discourse. We assume that everybody else is wrong and that not only are they wrong, but their wrongness has some some malevolent intent. And this is not true. The average American doesn't give a fuck about any of that stupid bullshit. They just want to fucking pay the lowest amount of tax they can and get shit at a good price and, and, and not have to worry about anything. That's what most people want. Yeah, and I, and I think what he's saying is this. Like, did you feel that you guys got so huge at a certain point that you were like, man, we're not necessarily talking about the personal shit we used to be talking about anymore. Therefore, if we do go behind a paywall, uh, this will help get us back to our roots, so to speak, and, and talk to the people that we were really talking to. Did you find yourself talking about topics that you were like, well, this could bring in huge ratings, but not necessarily what we believe in? No, I never. I mean, I was, the, the core of who I am is like, I'm always going to say what I'm going to say. Mm -hmm. And uh like I never say things just for numbers. I never do things for numbers. Uh, you know, people are like, "Oh, have you ever slept with anyone just to talk about it on the show?" Like, ew, no. <laughs> like, yeah, that's what I. That's what I was wondering that's too. Where I was like, "Hey, have you?" Yeah. No, that's like assaulting myself. I have never done that. Uh, but. Uh, it, no, it was more like we were continuing to have the open conversations, but people were then like using it against us because, you know, it's the problem, you know, with podcasting is because it really does feel like friends, you know, in your room talking to you. And because, you know, we, they only know us through podcasting. They don't know us through a movie or a TV show. We do feel accessible. And, and you know, comedians in general, I think are we are the most accessible artists, mm. which is beautiful in some ways and bad in a lot of ways because everyone thinks they can do our jobs. Right, right, <laughs> so that's, right. That's not good. Um, and so, I mean, we, you know, Christine and I did this huge episode where we both had uh, just truly coincidentally broken up with our boyfriends within uh, our long term boyfriends within a month of one another. Um, and then uh, people were trying to fuck our ex boyfriends within a week. Uh, so it's because like of the show. If you feel like you're friends with us, what yeah. if, wow, you're a shitty friend. So either way, you're in the wrong. And then, I mean, uh, both our exes uh, got into some legal shit with them. So, I mean, it was just too much information was out there. When you start using it against me, uh, I'm, I'm not going to just, like, sit there and be like, yeah, I'll do anything for people to listen to me. Like, I'm not 
I don't need that. No, it's, a, there, it's yeah, yeah. That, that's an important way to think about it, though, because uh, if you think about uh, just leadership in general over time, the people that get, uh, people who are, um, what's the word for it, hesitant to take leadership positions, even though they have the skills for it, usually do the best because they're very critical of their own power, right? And you should be. You should always be critical of your own power. That's a mistake Louis C.K. made. He thought asking these women to do what he was doing was a, that that made it okay, but he didn't realize that they were would say yes that it's okay because they don't want to offend fucking Jesus, right? right? Comedy Jesus. At the time, he was the most popular comedian around, other than maybe Chappelle, right? Yeah. When he was first coming back, so that's something that people didn't understand. And now you have to understand, like, if I see somebody in a leadership position and they're they're very subtly changing their language or their approach or whatever it is to gain that power and not staying on message. Then I immediately distrust that person because if you can, if you can, if you will say anything to get elected or chosen, whatever the case is, then you're, you don't care about the facts. You just care about the power, right? That's why I asked about the ratings thing, because we, we get that question all the time on this show of like, Hey man, is there anything that you guys talk about just for clicks and all that other shit? And it's like, no. And we're, we also don't care who we have on this show at all. Um, no, I, we, we really have been making an effort lately to get a good balance between both political aisles. Political aisles, everything across the, the board. walks of life as well, things like that. Yeah, because look, in our show is 94% dudes. Uh, we have dude yeah. listeners, so I'm, I'm sure they're <laughs> amped you're on today. But um, uh, it was interesting. You, you were talking about the, the lawsuits and things like that. Um, yeah. Because we, look, we deal with that shit all the time. Um, what... I know you're probably not allowed to, to talk about what happened with it, obviously, but um, uh, was it shocking when there was legal threats made about what you were saying on the air when it's just two best friends talking to each other? No, 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 because of who it was coming from. It, it, made, it made sense. I mean, and also just I am obsessed with uh, the entertainment industry. I have been since I was a little kid, so I know a lot of about it. And I also am coming from the, I used to be a, uh, a junior talent manager. So I was, I know a lot about the industry and, you know, these things are all things that are just going to happen as you're successful. Like people are going to start trying to sue you. It's part of it. Yeah. I don't think there's anyone who's really, uh, experienced a, a good amount of success who it hasn't happened to, yep. is so that it's where you, ass, but it's regular. Is that where you guys first met you when you were a talent, like a junior talent scout or some talent agent, whatever it was? Yeah, I worked at a place called Liebman Entertainment okay. uh, here in New York City. And after I graduated from SVA, uh, and Christina is a couple years younger than me, and mm -hmm. she was our intern. And that's how we initially met when I was, it was my first job out of college. Mm -hmm. So I was the assistant to the head manager at that I mean, time. that's a story of a, re a lot of really, really good startups, particularly in the tech community. Two employees, one that's fresh yeah. out of college, yeah. one, one that's working mid-level get together like, you know what? These guys are all assholes. We can do this way better than this. Let's just go fucking do it ourselves. I know. And I, it, be, you, it seems like crazy. It seems so ob obnoxious and arrogant, but then how many examples are where fucking Bill Gates walks out with the patent for fucking Windows? You yeah. Know what I mean, there's so many examples of this shit over the years. There's a million. And, and your co-host, she used to write for SNL, right? No, she didn't write. She interned for us. Oh, she <laughs> interned. Yeah, she was like really young when that when she was mm. doing that. When yeah. I when I read that she was a writer for SNL today, I was like, oh man, so that, that's a crazy gig. No, because by the time we like we were so like especially her, she was so young when we started that um, we kind of made our own thing. That in my opinion is better than being a writer for SNL. So she wouldn't need to. She she definitely aspired to be on SNL. Uh, <laughs> You know her her idol comedian is Gilda Radner, mm. but yeah, no, wow. we had already gone. Wait, past how old that. is she? Yeah, uh, she's how old am I? She's thirty two, and I'm thirty five. So wow, because Gilda was one of the the original. Like, <laughs> yeah, she was an OG watcher. Then she went back yeah. in time for that one. Of course, yeah. Were you? Uh, were you? Was that your dream as well? Did you ever have the um, SNL okay. dream as a comedian? Uh, it was mine growing up. You yeah. know. I think everyone wants to be like, I want to, I, my favorite S uh, SNL cast member of all time is Molly Shannon. And I definitely wanted to be on it, but I, uh, I stopped that dream a lot sooner. Once I realized uh, it was much more interesting to make your own things. Mm -hmm. Because again, like I had been working in the entertainment business since I was like 17 in some capacity. Uh, I interned for Michael Moore and a, a lot of uh, kind of big wigs and, 
in the business and I was like, oh, I want to go to bed, like feeling good about myself every night. And the only way to do that is to really do your own thing. I had been on a reality TV show uh, that I got fired from, <laughs> felt disgusting like every day. What did you get fired for? Let's, let's <laughs> yeah, what did you get fired for? Because I feel like it's probably somebody said something fucked up. And you're like, you know what? Shut the fuck yeah, up. Yeah, you're probably like, I'm out of here. Well, the show was girls who like boys who like boys. It was aired on Lifetime. Uh, there's a lot of serendipity surrounding it because the the person who ends it was about uh, females uh, in, living in New York City and their gay best friends. Oh boy! Um, and the the comic who ended up replacing me is actually Rosebud Baker, who years later would go on to be one of my closest friends, mm. a podcast co-host. Uh, but the reason we got fired was because they were trying to make me say that I was in love with my best friend. And I was like, but he's gay. That's literally the whole concept of the show. And then they were like, but he's so cute. And I go, yeah, but I'm not <laughs> like, I'm not, I mean, mentally ill. Like, why would I be in love with right. someone who has no interest? Like that should mean made no sense. Not just um, interested in you, but interested in anything about you. Yeah. Just, yeah. You know what I mean, what? Like, I like people who like me and everyone was like, that's narcissistic. And then I fucking asked my therapist and she said, no, that's actually the way that people should work. But they're everyone's just fucked. Well, up. technically, your therapist got paid like 250 bucks an hour to say that. I'm just not to <laughs> challenge his or her credibility. I'm just saying it's pretty <laughs> real. Did it? She can say me. I wish she can say wrong, uh, the things are wrong to me for sure. Um, and then uh, and then the other thing that they wanted to do on the reality show was let's send uh, my best friend to rehab for a pill problem that he didn't have. Meanwhile, he was like pursuing a career being a psychologist he's like i can't go to rehab for a, a plot you're Why? saying they don't let you prescribe medicine if you've got a history of abusing the medicine <laughs> what is this is america god damn it that's the reality let's show all for let's you. let's move to oregon because they just legalize everything everything like everything you don't even have legalized to legalize in oregon yesterday. doctor isn't cocaine, isn't cocaine legal now though? all cocaine, of it LSD. heroin and in small amounts, but I don't know what the fuck that's defined as. Because that's I, if, wild. A small amount of cocaine for me is different than a small amount of cocaine for you. Correct. Probably, right? Yeah. I've never done cocaine. Well, I don't I, I've, really? I, never? I, I would love it, so I can't do it. You would love it. Smart. Yes. Smart. I can tell. I, I understand. What, what, what's your drug history like? What have you gone down? Uh, I, don't, I only really do psychedelics. I, I, I was very anti-drug for a while. When I was a child, I read a book on Harry Houdini that really inspired me. And so I didn't I didn't like drink until I was 21. I didn't do my first drug until I was 30 years old. Wow. No well, shit. What was it? What was your first drug? Mushrooms was my first one. Good for you. Um, Ooh, that's a big entry. Pot doesn't work on me. Pot doesn't. I've tried. I've consumed it. I've eaten it. I've drank it. I've eaten it at hard candy. It has no effect on me. So I just stick to psychedelics. I Mushrooms, acid, DMT, done them all. How is DMT? Is I've the, actually got real. I've got one of these pens full of DMT at my house right now. So really, this could be a very interesting weekend. Yeah, for you. you may not hear from me again. Is what uh, I'm saying. Probably not. Let's see what happens. Um, the insurance guy's coming tomorrow, so make sure you sign that paperwork. <sighs> um, what was DMT like? Yeah, uh, really. I mean, good if you like yourself. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's an out of body it was, experience. It was, it's it's very interesting. I mean, I yeah. I've done a lot of psychedelics. I started. Uh, uh, I've got some issues. Um, Asperger style issues, and I started taking LSD when I was really young, as mm -hmm. a as a form of dealing with that. And I gotta say, I, I I don't know what I really expected the first time I did DMT, but it was not what I expected at all. It wasn't anything like any of the other trips I've had on LSD or mushrooms or opium or any of that other shit. Right? Uh, it it was. I felt like I was twenty feet up in the air, looking down at myself. And when I yeah. say when I say myself, I don't mean just my physical body. Mm -hmm. I mean like it's it seemed like some th this is fucking hot, crazy high person talk. Alex Jones would be fucking talking shit to me right now if I, if he was here. Yeah, same uh, with Brogan. Like, what, what, what are you? What are you on drugs or something? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyways, uh, so it's like I'm I'm seeing like a three dimensional view of all the things that have happened to me in my life, almost. Right? It's, yeah. It was the weirdest shit of all time, but it was fucking great. Was that was that your experience as well? No, do we, did you, uh, the looking down, I can definitely relate to, mm -hmm. did you break through uh, and like meet your maker? Well, no, I mean, I don't, I mean, pro I probably wouldn't be prone to something like that, frankly, because that, yeah. that, that's, that's, uh, doesn't make sense to me. But I think I've had those, I, I've, I've had those breakthroughs on smaller levels uh, so, for so long before I ever tried DMT. I don't think DMT was a big needle mover necessarily, although mm -hmm. well, I did see the benefit in the time because I remember like the first time as as an adult that I ever did LSD, 
I one of the first thing one of my first memories of it actually is is some guy trying to tell me some stupid bullshit. And I immediately, just from the micro expressions on his face, could tell he was full of shit. I'm like, oh, you're lying. And I said it out loud. I was like, hi, shit, right? I'm like, oh, you're mm -hmm. lying. And he's like, what? I'm like, what you just said is a lie. And he goes, no. I'm like, oh, great. <laughs> and I knew right then in that moment, I never had to talk to that guy again. So those little epiphanies that happen when you're on this stuff, um, mm -hmm. the rewiring of your neural channels and stuff is, is really interesting. I don't know that DMT really was a needle mover for me. So what did it change for you? What did you think before that you didn't think after? That's a good question that I like for people. Yeah, it did. I mean, it didn't change anything for me either. It kind of just reinforced the fact that I was on the correct path. Uh, I need to, I still, I mean, I need to do it again. Uh, cause I, there was a couple of people in my circle who at the time, like started doing it a couple of times. One person, I feel like it changed his entire personality. Like he did it too much in, mm. in a short period of time. And then, um, another person who was very close to me at the, at that time, who I don't see to anymore. Um, like I pretty much think it revealed that he, that he was a bad person and he even said that he like he said that to me and so that's a scary thing to hear from someone before you're about to do a drug but i didn't have any fear of finding out things about me that i, I didn't like and i went into it and it was just really a reinforcement of that i needed to uh live in the moment uh because that's like what i have i'm always working so hard that i don't really enjoy the thing uh like there's any success while i'm in it i'm always thinking of the next thing uh, so that's what I took from it. And that's why I like psychedelics because it's really the only time when I'm like in the moment, I can't even look at my phone screen. I can't look at a computer screen. Everything's messed up. I'm just enjoying my time in my own body, in my room with, you know, one or two people that I'm with. Yeah. I, look, I'm the same way as far as the success thing goes. Like I never measure it. I never take the time to appreciate it. Anything else. I'm always thinking about the next thing. Um, well, if you read D uh, Ray Dalio's book Principles, one of the uh, one of the principles of biz life and business he gives is to uh, to celebrate victories. Yes. Well, well so I, I will celebrate a victory, but it'll be for one night and one night only. No right. matter how yeah. big it is, I will spend that one night, one night only, and then the next day, whenever I wake up, I will forget about it and go back to the the thing, um, yeah. what, well, whatever the next thing I, is. I feel like if you're a highly motivated per person, the only thing that will satiate a high level of motiva individual motivation. And it's not you, everybody's not Jocko or or uh, what's the guy with the giant hands? The fuck's his name? Uh, <laughs> the, the, what the the uh, uh, what do you call it? The motivational speaker. What's his name? Oh, Tony Robbins. Tony Robbins. Yeah. His hands are huge, and it creeps me out. So yeah, not everybody is motiv is motivated in that way. A lot of people are motivated by just keeping their head down and grinding shit out, right? Yeah, and that's I think that's more people than the boisterous version of that. Frankly, probably right. Otherwise, we would hear it constantly, nonstop. Not everybody's motivated that way, but people that are motivated in any way, whatever it is, if there's not some goal or purpose going on, that brain just is off in left field somewhere. You're trying to create problems for yourself to solve at that point because that's who you are. You're a problem solver. You're a protector. You're, you're a, a homemaker. Whatever it is that your primary goal in life is, at least the way you're genetically hardwired mm -hmm. or, or, or affected by sociology, that's what you want to do. And if you're not doing it, it makes you unhappy. You feel unhappy and you don't know why a lot of times. Yeah. Is that you too? Mm, I mean, I, so, I, I feel like I don't, I could, don't create problems in like regular life. I create problems in relationships, but then I just realized I shouldn't be in them. But this is a very uh, recent uh, thing that I've come across uh, in my life. It's like a quarantine aha moment. So what happens when one of you gets married and has kids? Uh, that's never gonna happen to me. So we're good. <laughs> For real? Like, like you really no, genuinely? I have think no that? interest in having kids. Never have. Uh, and I don't think I'll get married. Any? Uh, I don't. Nor do I want to. So. Yeah. Why? Why is that? If you don't mind me asking. Part of it is like just things I've learned through the podcast. You know, when you have you know an hour, an hour and a half to really like talk out uh, your relationship life, you learn a you learn a lot, and so you're not just kind of going along with the. A uh, tide of society, and I think the tide of society is what pushes women to, you know, get married and have children. Uh, children, there's a million reasons why I wouldn't have to, wouldn't, wouldn't be interested in it. I do. I like kids very much. Uh, I would be a good mom. I had a nice childhood. One of the few people I know who did. Um, but because of that, like I, you know, thought very long and hard and seriously about whether or not I wanted children. And I mean, especially with the podcast, I feel like I've raised so many 
girls already. Uh, so I've kind of done that. And I just think I'm more useful to society if I don't, if I can take care of many people in little ways instead of one or two people in a big way. That's like my contribution mm. to society will be greater in that way. Um, and then, I mean, number two is I, I don't really, I mean, I have, I had, a, I've had a nice life knock on wood so far and it hasn't been that great. Like, I don't think the world's like a super nice place. Um, and I would adopt before I would have my own kids. So that's like a million reasons for there and marriage. Uh, I'm not like against it. I just don't think there's a lot, uh, uh in it for heterosexual women. I think it's not a great deal. <laughs> <laughs> well, it depends, honest, it depends not, on the state, I guess. Not a great deal for us. <laughs> it, it, it definitely depends on the state. There are a lot of states that still have pretty, uh, I guess, backwards views on people who are in long-term relationships but not legally married, right? So if you were to be the, if you if you were the person that was not the breadwinner, quote unquote, or at least the primary breadwinner in the house, and you live with this fucking chud for 15, 20 years, and all of a sudden he's like, you know what, get get fucked or you catch him doing shit or whatever whatever happens to make you split up, your life would be fucked at that point. Yeah. Right? Without some of these protections. I get it, I guess, but it sucks. It sucks that that has to be the case. It sucks that insurance is somehow cheaper for people if you're married, if you try to bundle your insurance together. If you're married and you're your child, somehow it's cheaper to get insurance. By the way, health insurance is bullshit. It's yeah. a total scam. Yeah, uh, and with you personally, like, dude, you're successful. Mm -hmm. You have a bunch of money. People know that. You have a huge show. Um, and then I'm gonna ask the obvious one. Like, I, I would assume there's a ton of guys just trying to fuck you because they wanna be on the show or hear about their lives or just say they fuck the girl that hosts that show. Yeah, I mean, I've had a lot less sex since I started the show. Obviously, you know, I was, again, I was like in a more wild phase when we started in my 20s. Um, I don't like have as much, I like, I'm still very sexual, but I don't like, I have to really like people <laughs> Yeah. now I have sex with them. I can't just like have sex with a hot guy who's going to, when I wake up in the morning, like have a conversation with me, that's going to make me want to blow my brains out. Mm. It's not worth it. Um, I am, you know, I'm a big fan of like a, a fuck buddy. Who's a, a friend. I like that. I don't really have sex with people that I don't know. Never have makes me feel uncomfortable. Um, but yeah, so oh my god, oh my god, I've lost track of where we're going. I was just thinking about um, guys I fuck. Yeah, no. No, it's fine. Look, our producer Giorgio is the exact opposite. He'll fuck anything. Um, yeah, complete well, dirtbag. And it, you know, it's a weird one too. By the way, it's not what you'd expect. He likes women who are late fifties, early sixties who have a boat. That is his dream <laughs> is to sail off. You can't see him. He's behind camera right now. But he he that. I've never met anyone like that. Any dude who's just like, man, give me a nice woman in her in her early sixties with a boat, uh, who's got maybe divorced, has a bunch of money, and uh, yeah. and then Georgie would never work again, and he well, wouldn't look, be a producer that, anymore. Th this is a round hole, round peck situation. That old, <laughs> I'm serious, God damn it, this old older woman that just wants to fucking for the first time in her life probably enjoy a little freedom because she was with some cunt for a long time. Yeah, she wants to enjoy a little freedom. And get plowed by a younger dude. Yeah. Which is great. Good for both of them. And that's And she's got a boat, so it's beneficial for him too. Plus, if he's into older women, which it seems like he is, then it all works out. That's a fucking round hole, round peg situation. And I'm all in favor of it. I am too, but Legalize it, is, it, right it is now. extremely I'm, rare. It's not illegal. No, but, it's not illegal, but it's extremely rare. And, yeah. and uh, we're proud of Giorgio mm -hmm. for that. Um, my wife, so I host a show with my wife um, called Ross Patterson Revolution. She's into daddies. Are you into daddies at all? Like that's her that's her thing. She's always like, look, when you die, I'm gonna marry Kurt Russell. Or Sam um, Elliott or something then, like yes. that. Yeah. That's it, it's either Kurt Russell, Sam Elliott, Kevin or Benicio Costner. del Toro. Maybe or Costner. Kevin Costner. And I, I would say post Yellowstone, probably Costner's up. Correct. There. He's going up the list right now with Yellowstone for sure. Correct. What are, are you into that as all? Yeah, I mean, since I was a little girl, my biggest uh, celebrity crush was Tim Curry. So I mean, I'm no sorry. Way. Did you from the Clue movie? What was yeah. it from? What, yeah, was it uh, no, from Rocky Horror. From, okay. And then I went, and then I just like went and watched. Robin Hood, everything. Men in Tights, maybe. Um, Wasn't he the I sheriff? also in Home Alone too. He's pretty hot when he's the concierge. Uh, so yeah, I'm a big Tim Curry fan, and I was like very obsessed with. Men I gotta, I, I gotta tell you, of the thousands of men that have acted in <laughs> movies Tim, over Tim the last Curry forty is not years, the dude. Yeah. No, they would Tim not Curry have been on my hot. list. Tim Curry in the 1970s and like his legs as Frankenfooter, like. 
he's a good looking guy. I'm pretty sure he's he's at least bisexual. Legs. I think probably just gay, but uh, he is uh, he's great and he's uh, he's charming. But, but that's what I like. You know, I like a little a little fat, a beard. I love curly hair. Definitely dark curly hair. Uh, can I can I can I make you an, an opposite pitch only because I've put him in like nine movies of mine? Um, sure. Can I throw you Barry Boswick? Can I throw Boswick your way? Uh, I but Barry Boswick is attractive, and he also has aged very well. Mm. I've met him. I go to like these horror conventions, so I've met like a lot of these people. Oh really? You <laughs> yeah. like you, you'll go out to the conventions? Barry's great, by the way. So he'll sign underpants for Rocky Horror Aww. Picture fans all the time. Yeah. Um, I did a yeah. couple with him when uh, when my first book came out. Um, I'd never been to a comic book convention or any of that stuff, right? Uh, yeah. The movies I was starring in at the time didn't really warrant that. Like it wasn't a right. lot of uh, horror or uh, or sci-fi. Um, that's kind yeah. of the, the jam for comic book stuff. Um, but uh, since I had put Boswick in a bunch of movies, uh, they put us together, and I got to see all those Rocky Horror Picture fans. And uh, he's aged great, and he is sharp yeah. and funny as shit. So let me pitch you, Boswick. He's got really ever... blue eyes to you. Yes, like very blue super eyes. blue. Yeah, yeah. You get lost. Wait, in I feel him. like it would be like too nice, though. Like I have to be careful with nice guys because, like, I don't. I'm not like someone who wants to be like treated badly, but like out a lot of like outwardly nice. I'm gonna eat you alive. So I just need to know that about myself. <laughs> well, go go uh, spend your evening tonight if you're if you're free and watch uh, FDR American Badass. Yeah, and yeah, you'll see. I, I put Barry Boswick in that movie. You can see how yeah. fucked he is. He's yeah. A, yeah, he's got a super twisted sense of humor. I think you can handle people with twisted sense of humor is, are are usually. Like to be a sarcastic, you have to be sharp and quick, right? Typically, yeah. yeah. So, it's a good sign. Anytime anybody tells me a super fucked up joke, even if I, because from doing comedy, you know, the joke either works or it doesn't. Yeah. If you do a joke and it's funny, even if it's taboo or whatever the fuck, people are still gonna think it's funny. That's yeah. just how it is. Do you like absurdist humor, by the way? Sometimes, yeah, it depends. I mean, I, it's a case by case basis. Obviously, there's you know people who have made everything unfunny. So. Mm. Yeah, there's. I here's what I want to recommend because I just saw this uh, a week ago. Is uh, Tim Heidecker did a stand up special that he just dropped free on YouTube where he is pretending to be the world's greatest comedian, um, and he does not break. Oh, sounds funny. He doesn't break the bit, and it's like parts of like uh, Chris D'Elia and some other. You can tell who the comedians he's channeling during during this thing. Um, right. But it's the worst comedian of all time, and uh, it's really well shot. He just put it on YouTube and just didn't, didn't say anything about it, um, and it That's came true. out. I was like, yeah, I was like, that doesn't even sound that absurd. I thought you were talking like, you know, like theater of the absurd, like you know, no, 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 Esco no. rhinoceros or something. Wait, I did like that. Wait till you <laughs> wait, wait till you see the absurdity of this character. I mean. I don't, right. wanna, I don't want to. I don't want to give it away. Yeah, the, the first four minutes, you're like, "Are you really fucking committing to this bit for four minutes?" Like it, it's that type of shit. Um, he also did it with a movie called The Comedy, which he was making fun of independent films, and uh, it was in Sundance. It is literally like every Sundance film you've seen, shot completely serious. But it's things like there was a girl who had a, an epileptic seizure on a boat about 45 mm -hmm. minutes in. And they leave the camera on this girl for 60 seconds. And it's shot like a drama, but he's, yeah. just, he's just drinking uh, whiskey, staring at her pussy. And you're like, <laughs> oh, my God, I can't believe this is happening. Wet Hot American Summer was, was one of my favorites, too. That's completely absurd as shit. Um, who's your jam these days, uh, comedian-wise? Gosh, uh, I mean, who's the, these days? I, mean, I feel like I'm so detached from comedy because I've been sitting in my apartment you know, doing Zoom shows. Are we talking about like, you know, uh, comedians that other people would know? No, it doesn't have to be. Like for, for example, mine is Tim Dillon these days. And like my my friends from, Always. but my yeah. friends from home don't know who that is. Like, really? Yes. I think like he got such a, you know, did, got such a bump during this. And finally, uh, because it was so, we, everyone was like watching him being like, when is he gonna pop? Like he's the funny, he's the only person we're all scared to follow. Mm -hmm. Like that's just gonna be good. I think Jessica Kirsten, who I'm so glad she finally got the Comedy Central special that Bill Burr produced. Um, I think she is so talented and just still hasn't got as much uh, attention as she should. Um, and then who I mentioned before, Ryan Long. I think he's mm. about to pop in a real big way. He already he's, kind of Dan's a Dan's a huge fan. Of. So fucking funny. Yeah, I yeah mean, and I love working with him. So it's it's really interesting to see a guy like that. That you see a lot of apolitical comedy these days. What you don't see is somebody that's genuinely going after everybody. Yeah, 
You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, and, and doing it in a super clever and pointed way. I love this dude. He's fucking funny as shit. Yeah, yeah. He's a hard worker. And then also, um, she's not stand up, but she's, uh, you know, characters and stuff. Uh, Meg Stalter, who you might know from the internet, basically. Yeah. I think she's incredibly talented, uh, very weird. Definitely get, you know, giving some Maria Bamford vibes, mm. but, you know, moving beyond that even. She's about to be like, huge i feel it's it's a weird spot where we're in because i think you know when we were on the come up again it was snl or you were hoping to get on a comedy central show or maybe get a Mm -hmm. pilot um with covid and everything shut down hollywood productions uh they're not doing a lot of new pilots comedy central is no longer doing live action shows uh after the end of this year um i don't even know if they're going to do specials one hour specials anymore um it feels like if you don't create your own content either via YouTube or Instagram or your own podcast as a comedian, those dreams that we once hoped for and uh, that was going to make you pop, uh, you really don't know anymore. It's just kind of people in, f- trying to find you on the internet. Mm-hmm. Isn't that the, the strangest part of all this shit right now where it's just like, oh yeah, because look, half of those people you mentioned, I don't know yet. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, like, that's even, so exciting though. I, lo- I, like, I, I know. love it. I'm going to discover them, and there's so much content that's free that's waiting for right. you. Yeah, and think about all those. Think about it from from let's say it's ten years ago, and the production companies and studios still have as much power as they did at that point. Yeah, right. Remember some of these people that they tried to really force on us, like this guy's yeah. going to be the next big thing yeah. or whatever the fuck else. It felt terrible. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It felt terrible because I didn't like the way it felt to have this person jammed down my throat, but I also didn't like the fact that now I'm 30% outside the zeitgeist because I'm not following what this fucking dum dum's doing every day. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I don't want to be dragged into that bullshit. Stop trying to do that. It's it's let the let let the people decide who is and is not funny. Okay? And then we'll do that. Yeah. I, I trust the people more than I trust record executives and studios and all this bullshit that are just looking at dollar bills, right? Yeah, and speaking of which, as a woman who has created a successful brand and company and and has a multi-million dollar deal off of a podcast, what is your advice for the next crop of women trying to be who you are right now? Well, that's the number one mistake. Don't try to be me, try to be Mm. yourself. I wasn't trying to be someone else, even though the, you know, the format for the show was Howard Stern for women. I wasn't trying to be Howard Stern. Mm. I was like, I just, you know, wanted to talk about sex openly the way Corinne Fisher would. Um, I think you're going to get, you know, I think anytime you try to mm, like just copy something, uh, without making your own adjustments or personalizing it to you, you're going to have trouble. Cause I even hear colleagues saying like, Oh, there's a couple new young female comedians, like doing basically a Corinne Fisher impression on stage. And I'm like, what does that even look like? Cause depending on my mood, like my act will be different. If I, you know, how much of a nervous breakdown do I want to have on stage that night? I think it's just figure out, you know, it's figuring out your voice, uh, but not just as far as a stand-up comedian. What is, what is the thing that you want to say to the world? And then that completely blowing that out of proportion in every way, in a good way. Because um, that's what I did. I was just like, I'm just going to be me. And if people like that, that's fine. And if they don't, that's also fine. If everyone likes you, <laughs> you're, you're making a lot of mistakes. <laughs> yeah. Speaking about being on stage, uh, have you been back since COVID or... or yeah. uh- you have yeah. uh, where, yeah, where at? Road. I've done a lot. I've done a lot of stuff since uh, since then. I did take about a four and a half month break, which is the longest I have taken in the ten the decade I've been doing stand up. Did you so. enjoy it or not? Because it, it's been hit loved hit it. or miss for yes. Yeah, so some loved of my comedian friends it. loved it. Some of them hated it, and they got out of their rhythm, and they were like, "Shit, man! I I needed to perfect." this one thing and I couldn't get back on stage and it really fucked well, if me you're, up. If you're someone that uh, relies on crowd work to get into your groove and a lot of comedians, a lot of standups do that. Right. Like they'll introduce, they'll do a little bit, they'll do a couple of minutes, then they'll do some crowd work to get to feel good. Then mm-hmm. they'll move into their material after that. If you're one of those people, it's got to be challenging, right? Yeah. Like if, if it, it's hard to do crowd work when the person is 20 feet away and is wearing a goddamn Darth Vader mask. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like yeah, it's, for, it's difficult. It's different for you. I, I I would imagine you're so busy that it forced you to slow down. Is that what you kind of yeah, encountered? I mean, 
I was like had fun for the first time in like 10 I don't I don't I mean actually I was like I had fun and relaxed and I don't remember doing that since I was I don't know the sixth grade I bought a trampoline I would just let myself gain 10 pounds I've already since lost it but like it was really nice to just like eat whatever the hell I wanted not have to worry about taking a picture being on camera um uh and and my body kind of reflected like my skin got better than it ever had because I was like sleeping and just being really happy and spending time with my dog and reading books and watching movies like I have a tv I'd never even watched more than like 20 minutes of tv a day now I like know what's happening on succession like that was very exciting for me um I did start to get nervous you know around like the four month mark about like fuck am I gonna lose all this work mm. that I put into stand-up you know I had been doing when I'm in town I was had been doing 15 shows a week in New York City holy Getting shit up, wow yeah like really like I mean like really like healing myself doing every spot that was offered to me um and so now that we're back it's more like three shows a week and you know on the downside jokes take longer to write because you don't get as many workshops with mm. them but i don't feel i feel like i'm still good like i you know was in uh, comedy works denver a couple weeks ago and you know i did have some of those performances where you get off stage and you go i'm good at this and i this is exactly what i should be doing right well, um, i was if, worried like i was so happy that i was like should i fucking quit stand up and then i was like no like i love i love stand up as a as a as an art it, there was just a lot of other shit that was connected to it that mm. i didn't like there was a lot of people that i hope to never see again but you know that's every job so uh but like stand up wise other comedians that you you didn't enjoy working with or sitting in the back of the club with yeah, most of them. <laughs> <laughs> you hate all of them. Um, I don't like a lot of people. And certainly, pe uh, for the most part, comedians are uh, very smart and very interesting, but carrying a lot of baggage with mm. them. Um, and I think what's unique about Christina and I is that whatever baggage we had with us, we've spent a lot of time working through it so that we're not unpleasant to be around. And a a lot of our colleagues haven't done that work. Um, and it has nothing to do with having money or anything like that. This was literally just us sitting, talking to each other. Uh, well, maybe that'll maybe that'll be a new trend though in new media, independent yeah. media, because uh, it does seem to be changing from scripted to conversational. Now there was a, yeah, in, yeah. The, in the late 90s, we, well, I guess even in the early 90s with the advent of reality TV, we started to see some kind of uh, shift away from scripted to non-scripted television. And then all of a sudden it became not non-scripted television that is very clearly scripted, right? Mm -hmm. But now with independent media, people are just having a conversation with a couple of their friends and a couple of million people listen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right? I, but I also think that uh, during COVID and everything, because people can't go out in a lot of cities and everything, uh, it almost feels like you have new friends and you're able to spend time with friends by listening to podcasts. Um, I know our numbers have certainly what doubled or mm. tripled, I think, for this month. But uh, uh, again, it, it feels like you're sitting around hanging out with, with more people than you actually are and people that you like because you can just keep going through and finding uh, what you want. Mm. Um, have you had any gigantic negative experiences like, like the Louis C.K. shit where you're just like, oh, man, this dude jacked off in front of me and I had to bounce or, or anything like that in the stand-up world? You mean, oh, like things that men did to me? Yeah. No, no, but that's because of the kind of chick I am. Mm. Like, it would be, like, for, I don't know if you're familiar with the story Ransom of Red Chief, but um, in short, it's about a kid, who, and my mom used to tell me this as a nighttime story. Uh, it's about a, a kid who gets uh, kidnapped, mm -hmm. and he's so fucking annoying that they don't even wait for the parents to pay the ransom. They're like, please take him back. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of like <laughs> what I am as a person. So, like, you know, if you are, if you're preying on people, you're going to look for easy prey. You're not going to look for it, the most difficult, loudest prey that there right, is yeah. and that's who i am it's a it's a path so of uh, least resistance it would be yeah. a bad move um and I, that is 100 percent part of the reason why so i don't want to say that like this stuff doesn't happen in comedy it does it does just didn't happen to me because i'm very loud and i would also i mean i would i would if someone did that to me i would fucking kick their dick in <laughs> 
Yeah, that's that that's. Being said, I do think you can ask someone if you, if you if, like if you have a kink. I think you can ask them. Probably just not in the green room at your place of work. Yeah, yeah, I agree. With the Louis C.K. thing, it was just like a lot of those stories was like, oh, Jack's off in front of me. Why don't you just leave the room or hang up the phone? Like one of them was on the phone. It was like just hang up the fucking phone. I don't I don't understand that. I mean, I think it's like you know, it's it, sometimes you're so shocked by something. It's deer. It's deer in headlights. You're so shocked that something is happening. That someone is behaving in this way. Um, you know, and everyone re reacts to things you know differently so you know if you feel like someone is taking your power away which is certainly like what sexual assault is doing you might not even know how to react so it's like yeah it's easy to say you would leave but you know and also god i think other people treat celebrity in, in a different way than i do like i met a, the spice girls and they're my favorite absolute favorite people of all time and i just walked up to mel b like and i was like hey how are you but like you know, if it's your favorite comedian, maybe you would be shocked. Maybe you would be in shock. Maybe you wouldn't know what to say. Maybe you would feel like you're less than them. Mm. So many people are walking around feeling less than, and I think that really uh, dictates how we how we behave as humans. So and I just don't feel that way. If I I can meet the president, I mean certainly this one, but any president, and and, and I wouldn't feel like, oh my god, I can't believe I'm here with the president. I'll be like, this is awesome. This guy's president. I could be president too if I put a lot of work into it. You so know? what you're saying is you would let Scary Spice masturbate in front of you and you would be freaked oh, out by it because it's... it's. Uh... I wouldn't want to. I don't want to see my heroes masturbate. One of my favorite singers tried to fuck me and I said no. Who was it? I, like, I can't say. Um, but uh, he's not super, fam not super famous. Um, but yeah, like I just... It would ruin it for me. Britney Spears tried to fuck me one night. I don't want to see my favorite singer come. Like... Britney Spears trying to fuck me one night. I'll, I'll yeah. tell you. Yeah, you can tell me if you want. Like yeah. pegging? No, That's no. So I, cool. I, I was with my girlfriend on New Year's Eve. Do you remember when she got married to Jason Alexander uh, in Vegas that night? Her, her guy, the guy she knew from high school? Correct. It was yeah. then. Mm -hmm. And there was something different about her and everything that was going on. She walked through this restaurant directly to my table. And I'm, I'm having dinner with my girlfriend at the time. And we'd been dating for a long time at this. And she was like, you let's go and just said that at the table and i was like oh Brittany, go girl i he, never thought she had it in her she does and here's the thing like i'm in a at that, at that point i was thinking it was in like a four or five year relationship or whatever it was and i was like I, it Is was it you're married to now or are you no 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 it's not and i wish i would have just fucking left because then i would have yeah. married her and then i would have been the the dude and that would have been rad because i want to see whatever fucking weird shit she's got going on yeah now you would you would be kevin federline by now yeah. by the way. whatever man i'm, not, I'm just saying got a great life if, so, got a great if, life. if you see a bunch of people walking in front of you and they're falling <laughs> off the edge of a cliff maybe take a pause and look around yeah <laughs> you know what, what i mean what what i'll say is this Brittany. Brit Brit, if you're watching, um, I made a mistake that night. I am sorry. Um, but she was that forward about it. And so um, my girlfriend was just like, hey, I'm here, right? And, and started yeah. talking to her. And she was like, I don't really care. Um, and so she was like, well, this is my boyfriend, blah, 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 blah. And Britney Spears ended up walking away. 20 minutes later, she came back to the table and she was like, so are we getting out of here or what? I mean, literally right Damn. in front of my, yeah. And I was like, I am, I, I, I should leave. I should leave right now. I didn't leave. It's a big clip. And oh. I didn't leave. Uh, hey, either way. Um, there is it, like, yeah, there's a lot of fucking heroes. I'd let masturbate in front of me. Abraham Lincoln's one of them. Morgan you know Freeman. Yeah. Morgan Freeman. Go ahead and pull it out. You think, I, I, I think Morgan Freeman probably goes like reverse. I don't know why. Yeah. He I probably just, goes in my head. If I, when I think about him masturbating, which I do a lot. Yes, I always think Sidewinder all the time. I don't know why. Do you? Is there any? We we have some psychologists on I staff want, here. I never thought about the way he masturbates. No, I, I want well, him no one to should. do no JOI though. I want him to do jerk off instructions. That while I would he's probably doing do it. just for the the weirdness of it. Yes. I would probably listen to that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, there, there we are, Ross. There we are. Now I want you to make eye contact. I'm going to go real slow right now. There it is. <laughs> like I want, and I want him to say, uh, like to close it, like as he's finishing, just say. I'm Morgan Freeman, and I just masturbated in front of you. And then walk away, and I'd be like, all right, sweet. We're all done. We're all done. That would be iconic. I, I'd yeah. be down with that. Um, now's the point in the show we get to the drinking bro of the week, uh, which is someone who has inspired you or helped you become the person you are today. Uh, Corinne, who would you like to give the drinking bro of the week to? Oh my God. Who helped you out the most uh, along this journey? No here? pressure to like satisfy all the people, the, yeah. the dozens of people that have probably actually helped you. So no pressure. 
mean, God, it's so, I mean, like, it's so corny, but like the person who's helped me the most is definitely my mom. Mm. Definitely my that's mom. That's not corny. I don't, it's not corny at it's all. It's not man. corny or rare. Most uh, men say dad, most women say mom. Yeah. Well, no, I know that's what I'm saying. I'm sure, I'm sure this is what everyone says. Mm. <laughs> but what, what was uh, it yeah. specifically that she said, hey, man, I think you can do this or believe in yourself? Well, it's not any of that. Quite the opposite, actually. You know, she would be like, you know, I'd come in having, you know, lost 10 pounds and she'd be like, now all you need to do is tone up a little bit. But that's like, <laughs> I thrive with tough love. I thrive under tough love. I don't, I can't be coddled. It makes me into a brat. Um, uh, I, and I think I didn't realize how, how special my mom uh, was until I started doing Guys We Fucked and realized the terrible fucking jobs a lot of people's parents did on them mm. and i know people like to say my parents tried their best no they didn't based on the stories <laughs> oh my god just yeah. real bad um my mom you know always taught me that i you know to speak up when you see something wrong like you know it's like injustice and i'm talking about from like age six i knew yeah you know, i knew to do this um never made me feel like i couldn't do anything because i was a woman um never la laughed at any kind of dreams that i pitched always let me drove me around to a bunch of stores to get the exact Halloween costume I wanted, you know, with not spoiled at all. Like I had to bring home straight A's, otherwise it was a problem, but just really valued important things and kind of like laughed at things like spending a lot of time on hair or makeup. Uh, and I, and I think that's like a really solid foundation to start on. Cause like I taught myself hair and makeup later. That's easy stuff. You can learn that from YouTube. You can't learn self-confidence and self-worth mm. from YouTube. People try, but it's very difficult if you to to uh, come into it, in, you know, in your 30s. And I just see so many people walking around who hate themselves. And I go, God damn, life must be very difficult for mm. you. I really can't imagine uh, not liking myself. Right. Well, look, uh, we're super grateful that you stopped by the mm -hmm. show today. Tell everybody about the new podcast, uh, where they can find you uh, on the other one and uh, and everything else you got going on. Yeah, absolutely. Especially if you guys have a lot of uh, dues, you know, uh, without a country, definitely mm -hmm. not a female uh, podcast. It's a podcast for everyone. It's on the Gas Digital Network, but then you can get it wherever you listen to podcasts uh, on Saturdays, including full video on YouTube. We just explore the most controversial news stories of the week from the perspective of the extreme right and the extreme left. And again, that's what the wonderful, hilarious Joe DeRosa. Um, and then the OG podcast, Guys We Fucked, is on Luminary, but there's like six and a half years of free content on iTunes if you want to get to know us a little bit and follow me on Instagram and Twitter at philanthropy gal. Yeah, there it is. There it is. Uh, it should be great on American party. Dan's got a new spinoff show with uh, medal of honor recipients, uh, Dakota Meyer called the American party where uh, it's not the right or the left. It's just what should be right for America and how there should be another party for America. Well, I mean, uh, I don't think there should be any, any parties, right? Political parties. That, that was a mistake this whole time. Yeah. I, the idea that we should be working towards uncommon goals makes no sense in government. Right. Why would that be the case, right? We should be working towards the common goal of providing the best in whatever category we're talking about, whether it's defense or healthcare or, or the first amendment or whatever the fuck it is, economic equality, whatever we yep. should be, we should be focused on the best metric for measuring how we're doing in those categories and not whether or not my fucking candidate won. Right. That's nonsense. Yeah. Well, I look, I'd love to see you on that show as well. Uh, we appreciate your time today. Uh, for D'Anthony, D'Anthony Holloway, mm -hmm. I'm Ross Patterson. This is the Drinking Bros. Good night, everyone. <laughs>